Hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bill Murphy, your host of Technical Talks, and thank you for joining us. Today is part two of our stormwater quality series, and we call it that because in February, we had a webinar series that started with stormwater quality with some other solutions. We had so much content to cover, we had already scheduled it for a two-part series. Uh, unfortunately, that first one in February was cut short about 45 minutes in. So we still owe you the rest of that for our YouTube channel. So stay tuned. We are gonna wrap up recording on uh, part one of two for the stormwater quality webinar. And we hope to get that done by the end of this week. So we'll upload that to our YouTube channel. For any of you who were on that one and got cut short, we will send you that link. And for those of you who are joining us now, if you were not a part of the one in February, you'll be able to get that YouTube link as well, and you'll be able to tie those two together, the February webinar and then today's April 5th webinar on stormwater quality. That's why we call it part two of two, and I'm joined by a couple of friends today uh, from City Green and from Rocky Mountain Bioproducts. I'll introduce them here in a moment, but first in getting started with our normal introduction, I'll go quickly through this for the sake of time, so we have time for these other two experts uh, we are part of Hale Holdings uh, family of businesses. I am the civil engineer for Quick Supply, ASP Enterprises, Bowman Construction Supply, and Cascade Geosynthetics. And we are a large company, but yet we're a family-owned company. So we feel very small with our local branches. The reason I say we're a large company is we cover a large area and we all work together. And that gives us a lot of uh, power and ability, speed and agility that we otherwise wouldn't have. Here's a map that some of our friends like to use to some of those that have offices across the country. A uh, particular engineer, a friend of mine, uh, Madison Gibbler, often asks me to share this so that she can share with her other Burns McDonnell engineering offices, for example, uh, which company they ought to be looking for locally to help with specification work, primarily stormwater products and erosion and sediment control. Speaking of all those different solutions that we have, uh, you know, we only cover a couple at a time for this webinar series. We sometimes try to lump a lot of them together. We did that last fall. If you've not seen those webinars, please go to our YouTube channel and find the ones on erosion control, sediment control, geosynthetics. Uh, we are now doing stormwater management, and we're going to include some vegetated solutions today as well. Um, our hardscapes, guys, we're talking about maybe in the fall doing a hardscape series. We'll see how that goes. We are blessed and we've been blessed for years with um, a lot of experts in trucking, in logistics, in warehousing, in retail and um, inventory management, but really it's in solutions. And that's where all of our local sales reps are ready to talk to you. And we can help take those big projects and put them into bite-sized chunks. When we deliver those solutions to you, as you can see, we're able to take a number of different uh, products that become solutions and put them on our trucks and get them right where you need them when you need them. Looking back, I mean, last month was spectacular. Clean and Green is done. This was a slide that I'd used uh, in February to try to promote Clean and Green, and it went fantastic for us. We had a lot of people at all six locations. If you were there, thank you. If you weren't there, uh, thanks anyway, and come next year because you sure missed out on a heck of a party. Uh, we did get a lot of tremendous feedback in our surveys. So we will continue with Clean and Green. I told you this is part two of two. And I used this same slide for part one, and we talked about innovative solutions to follow a raindrop. And uh, part two is gonna focus primarily on urban trees and healthy soil. When we talk about sustainability, we talk about um, vegetation, we talk about tree canopies that have shade and reduce heat island effect. But I can let our expert friend from City Green, Mr. Steve Lover Lovering, do a better job of covering that than I do. Um, and I just highlighted some of the words from the registration link that you got uh, to register for this webinar. And these are the things we told you we would cover. And Steve's going to cover enhancing communities. And he's going to talk about improving water quality. And you may not even realize that your community has an urban forester or that there's some people involved with urban planning in your community that are trying to reach some better tree canopy goals and assigning value to those. And as part of many states water quality initiatives, they're looking for healthier soil and healthier vegetation. And with that, I introduce you to my friend, Mr. Steve Lovering. And we've already introduced you to Stradivault sometimes in the past, but we continue to evolve our knowledge of green infrastructure and our understanding based on experiences and we just wrapped up cleaning green the past couple of weeks and Steve was a huge part of that. So we're going to share this on this Tech Talks webinar, a little bit of an update on City Green Stratavault. And with that, Steve Lovering. 
Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Tim. Nice to be here with you today. Got some really interesting things to talk about here as far as uh, green infrastructure goes and using trees and soil and the trees' roof systems to clean, take pollutants out of uh, storm water. And also teach you a little bit about how trees grow as well. So it's going to be interesting uh, next 20 minutes here. Definitely looking forward to it. I think maybe we'll get right into this. So urban environmental challenges here with, with these, uh, what we call soil soil systems or tree vault systems, we're trying to solve four main urban environmental challenges. The first one is trees in community spaces. We cannot get trees to grow underneath hardscape areas with the type of methods we're using currently where the trees have got no soil volume underneath that hardscape. And trees are lasting between three to five years typically, which is obviously not very good. It's becoming a crisis. Uh, the second challenge we're trying to overcome here is clean waterways. So let's try and clean this storm waters coming off these roads. Uh, by the way, when I say storm water, I'm talking about rainfall. Large amounts of rainfall typically referred to as storm water. So let's take that storm water in from a road or from a sidewalk and clean that. And let's do it with the uh, soil underneath the sidewalks and the tree's root system. Uh, the third challenge we're trying to overcome is uh, the urban heat island effect. And depending where, where you're watching this from today, it's dependent upon how much of a problem this is for you. Uh, of course, it is a global problem, but some of our friends in the, in the southern states definitely suffer with this a lot more than uh, people up in Canada do. And then the fourth one is meeting urban canopy targets. So lots of cities across the states and Canada have got these urban canopy targets in place. And we, we can really help with that with that issue as well. So lots and lots of challenges that we're trying to overcome with these soil cell systems. And uh, I'm going to show you how. Okay, so root systems. What do root systems look like? This is a tree's root system underneath a surface, whether it be a forest or a field or a hardscape environment. And as you can see, these root systems are actually root plates. So they grow in a long linear fashion underneath the ground and they're trying to keep as close to the surface as they possibly can. So there is a myth out there that trees root system will grow into a huge ball underneath the ground. That's not actually how it works. Again, they, they all want to be at the top where the nutrients, where the oxygen and where the water are or is. Here's a couple of images of these root systems here. So the one on the right is in a field application here, and you can see that big root plate there directly underneath the surface of the uh, of the grass area. And the image on the left, again, a big, a big, a big plate. And this one, unfortunately, didn't didn't get wasn't planted deep enough. There wasn't enough soil underneath this root system. So as soon as we got a couple of big windstorms, this tree actually blew over. We, this is pretty common actually people don't understand that while these tree root systems are root plates we still need to provide an abundance of soil underneath them so we can have some of the roots go there and grab hold of what they need to now when we take a typical tree uh, tree any any species really or most species in north america for sure and we cut its root system and stick it into a a bowl or a small plate we get a bonsai tree. Now, when we take that same tree and we cut its root system and stick it in between a curb and a sidewalk, we get an urban bonsai tree, which is the image you see on the right. Too many of these in all of our cities across the US. It, it, it's crazy. And the, the answer is more soil volume beneath the ground for these root systems to really get into and used to grow into large mature canopy trees. So if you look at the image in the middle there, this is a detail of exactly what we've done. These things are called tree coffins. So again, very, very little room for the tree's root system to really spread out and get the nutrients that it needs. Now, when we do this kind of planting, we've got two options. We get the first option is dead trees. They just don't have the type of soil volume beneath the ground they need. And they end up dying, and then we end up replacing them with uh, with cones. Unfortunately, the the second option is dead sidewalks. So these trees' root systems really get in, find whatever they can. And as you can see, this big tree here in the right hand side image has actually <clears throat> um, found the large grassed area on the other side of the sidewalk. 
spirits growth, and of course that's resulted in a, in an upheaved upheaved sidewalk. Now this here shows you what we're currently doing with our urban trees. This is how much space we're currently giving them for for growth, and this next image is what we need to be providing for them. So the large red circle shows you how much soil volume we should be giving these trees to enable them to become these large mature street trees. Now our solution is the product right here. So this is called a tree vault. And if you look at this image, all of this section below here is full of our system and completely full of soil. So now we're not having these little square rectangle spaces for these um, the soil. We've got these large vault areas, which are providing lots and lots and lots of soil volume for these trees. Here's our system here. This is the Strata Vault 30 series. So again, the concept of these, this product is it's, it's a structural plastic module that sits underneath a hardscape. It provides the structure to the surface while allowing the void space within the module for the soil for the tree roots or for soil for stormwater management, or it can be left completely void as well for underground infrastructure, pipes, utilities. So many, many uses, but today we're going to be talking about a void space for soil for tree roots, and then we're going to run the, the stormwater through it and clean the stormwater. So here we go, water harvesting. Image on the left is the preferred way for every city to, to clean its stormwater. We're running this water through trees, through plant life, through soil, and that polluted stormwater now becomes a clean product. And the image on the right is what we're currently doing now. So we've got the you know a typical city environment, we've got lots of concrete, asphalt, and we're running all the water from the surface into the city's drain. And this water is extremely polluted. So it's got all types of metals, oils, and petroleum pollutants within it. And we're sending all that into uh, local streams, rivers, oceans. It's not good. There's a, there's a much better way to do that. So let me show you our solution. So the image here, look, you can see this is a soil cell system underneath the ground. This soil cell system has an abundance of soil and tree roots within it. And then this is a sidewalk here. And then this to the left is the road. And you've got a catch basin, a typical catch basin that we see in any city. Now, currently, that city is sending all the water from any hard service into this pipe, which is what we showed in the last image there on the right. It's all that polluted storm water running into this pipe into the city system. Again, not good. What we're saying is why not run that water in through this pipe into the massive abundance of soil and the soil and the tree roots will actually clean the pollutants out of the stormwater. Something very illegal has to be happening upstream for this tree to be affected because the tree's root system will actually take up all those pollutants and use it for its growth. Like trees are fantastic uh, ways to clean all these pollutants. Now there's four different ways to bring this storm water in from a road or from a sidewalk. The first one is by using a catch basin, similar to this. We just talked about that briefly. Uh, the second one would be to use a curb drain, which this thing gets uh, set into the curb at the time of the curb pour. And again, all that water runs through the face of that curb drain into the green perforated pipe. And then the water drains out the perforated pipe into the soil. These curb drains, uh, something we manufactured actually, and, and Bill's team can, can sell these to you as well. Very, very inexpensive. And these would replace a curb cut or a bios wheel. And then you'll notice here as well, we have got this overflow pipe at the bottom that'll take that water out of the soil cell system. By the way, now it's a clean water product, and that will now run into uh, the city system or into ponds, lakes, oceans. Or we can use permeable solutions. So some of you have, might already be using uh, permeable pavements, uh, permeable grouts as well. They're a really good solution too, to get all this water running down into these soil cells, evenly spreading that water out. And then again, the tree roots can use that water 
for their growth. The idea here, guys, is that we want to be using 100% or as close to it as we can uh, of the water that lands on the surface. Let's use it to, to grow the green infrastructure within our cities. And then the fourth one is using a trench drain. So very typical, I'm sure a lot of you have worked with trench drains before. Very good way of getting, getting water quickly from a hardscape environment into a softscape environment. Now, stormwater tanks are getting installed all over the US. And these basically are large void cells underneath the parking structure, typically, or a, even in a field uh, in a streetscape environment. Now, we, we can do this with our product, but we think there's a better way. Why would we spend all of this money on a massive tank that goes underneath a parking lot or a hard surface that's only going to realistically be used about 5% of the year? So any massive storm events, 100-year storm events, 75-year storm event, these things are going to fill up. But anything else, anything other than that, these are never going to get used or utilised. So our solution to this would be to use a tank but the tank is actually going to go underneath the, the soil cell area, which is there for the trees. So in this particular design, we've got the water falling onto this parking lot. The water is then going to run through this trench drain into this green pipe. And then the perforations in the green pipe are going to allow that water to drain into the soil for the tree roots which is doing exactly what we want to do. Again, we're using 100% of this water that lands or close to it for the trees to really enable them to grow in this hardscape environment. Now, should we get that 75 or even 50 year storm event, we've got this perforated layer down here, or sorry, permeable layer, which is going to allow that water to drain through it into this chamber. And this chamber can be sized by the engineer to of capacity to hold whatever rain event that engineer needs it to. And then we've got a few options at this point. We can either let that water soak into the ground or we can allow it to flow away into um, our ponds and rivers and oceans, again, as a clean water product. Or what we can do is we can store that water with a pond liner and reuse that water for irrigation purposes. So a few options, again, I think this is much better than just using a large tank in the ground. Very expensive also, these large tanks. This is a much better way to go. So we do a ton of streetscapes with this kind of concept here. Just to quickly touch on this one. This is a road here. All the water comes onto this road. It flows off this road into this channel and then through these grates into the soil cell area where the trees are going to be planted. Parking lots are also a very big deal. We do lot, tons and tons of these. And what a great way to turn grey into green. We've got this massive asphalt area. If we can plant trees and really get some tree canopy going, then we're, it's a much better space. People are more inclined to, to park there. And also the soil and the tree roots can clean all of the oil, petroleum and metal pollutants that are coming off this parking lot as well. So lots of uh, wins with parking lots. Which leads me to my first case study. So this was a very cool project. This one is actually up just north of uh, the states in Edmonton, Alberta, very, very cold climate. And this, this sports center here had a, it's got a very large parking lot. And the problem with it was it was getting, it was flooding a lot. And the overflow pipe was taking the excess water into the North Saskatchewan River which that's a big problem because, as, as you know, the, the water coming off a parking lot is typically full of all types of pollutants and contaminants. So the first, the idea on this one was firstly to collect all of the storm water and prevent the flooding, and secondly, to grow large trees in this parking lot. So let's get into this and show you how this worked. So the contractor excavated the, uh, the first section of the parking lot. This was done in two phases because it, it was a large project. And then we put down the drain pipe here within the uh, graveled area in case any excess water would fill up. And then this pipe could then take that water into the city system. And then we started installing the cells. 
So this area here where this gentleman's walking down, this is where the soil cell, uh, sorry, this is where the boulevard in the middle of the parking lot is going. This is the tree trench. And then the area here with the, with the guys are going to fill this up around the trees or fill it right to the top. But when, when, the, when the soil is not going right around the trees, they actually drop the soil level to give them more void space for the stormwater in case it starts to build up. So this thing is never going to flood. There's tons and tons and tons of void space within the cells for stormwater to build up and then slowly go through the soils. Now, image on the left here, this is the catch basin that we're going to be using. And there's a few of these dotted throughout the parking lot. And the water is going to come from this catch basin through this pipe into the cells. And within the catch basin, there's two pipes. There's one which is lower, which is taking the water into the cells. And this one's a little higher, because if this one ever gets blocked for any reason or freezes or anything else, then the water can come through this one into the city system. So it's an overflow pipe, basically. And the image on the right now, we can see the pipes running through the cells and you can see the perforations. There's three different perforations of these pipes, so uh, the contractor didn't do this one wrong. Uh, the water is going to flow at the bottom of the pipe. So again, more construction uh, photographs here. You can see what we just described. There's some advertising for Home Depot right there as well. Um, and then we've got a granular collar coming down the side of the cells. And this whole thing is going to be covered with asphalt, it's an asphalt parking lot. Now, here's the finished version right here. So this uh, this project's been in the ground now for two years. We haven't seen a drop of flooding in that two years, so it's worked. And the cells are actually underneath all of the parking stalls. And this strip here is where that gentleman was walking earlier that you saw in the earlier, earlier image. Now, they did plant very small trees in this, which, which is a bit unfortunate, but over time, the tree's root system will be spreading out underneath the, these stalls and using all of this stall, all of the space and the soil volume. So these trees will become huge uh, urban trees that the uh, the people who park in these lots will, will really enjoy shade when they get in and out of the car. Now, case study two is on a development, so a little bit different, but it's actually based on the same sort of theory. Again, it's, it's, a, it's a parking lot in this case. And this is the development site here. So if you look on the left, this parcel is a typical development parcel for North America. It's about the right size. And they, they had a big stormwater pond on this particular design. Now, this client wanted to sell 20 of these parcels of land in 20 years so the engineer came to us and said how can we make these parcels of land more valuable in 20 years than they are today and everybody got together had a conversation about it and we decided if you actually remove this stormwater pond then we've got a lot more developable land so obviously to remove the stormwater pond you've got to have somewhere else for the waters to go and, and we decided to put the water underneath the ground in our soil cell system to not only grow the trees, but also to store that water and let it slowly release into the ground. So this parcel then turns into this parcel, more development opportunity where that storm pond was. And if we look further into this, the blue areas are where the cells are going. And the circles are the catch basins that's allowing the water to drain into the soil cells. Here's a parking lot. Okay. Now, if we do the math, again, this is all about value of land. And we did the math based on five years in the future, not 20, because that was too far ahead. So if we look at five years in the future, this parcel of land that was on the left would have been worth $14,942,000. Again, based on national averages across North America. The land value on the right now without the stormwater pond is actually $24,762,000. So it's actually gone up by $10 million. The cost of the soil cells on this project was $765,000 as well, whereas the cost of putting a storm pond in would be a lot more than that. So again, we, we, we've actually got upfront cost savings as well as land value uh, savings as well on this project. So really, really interesting.
again, if you've got any developments or parking lots you're looking at doing, we, we can help. We've got some great designs and we've actually got a full design team of three staff. And all they do is work with landscape architects, engineers and cities on these design ideas. So, solar cells on a budget. Some of you might be going, well, how much do these things cost? The, the actual product itself is actually fairly inexpensive. The, the cost of it can be the installation when the contractors are not that familiar with the system. But I can tell you that once they are familiar with the system, it's actually very, very simple to install and takes no time at all. It takes about two minutes per cubic meter if you're in Canada. Uh, I'll have to do the math on exactly what that is, but it's it's super super quick. So we've got a we've got a tree planted into a boulevard here. And we see this in every city typically. We've got the road here, and we've got a sidewalk, and then we've got typically a lawn space or a you know some sort of strip of planting or green space. Instead of blocking these tree roots into this little space here. And we see all sorts of little tiny little shrunken trees in these tiny little strips of boulevard. Why not just have a thin strip of soil cells linking this tree with this green space? And of course, this is full of soil as well. So this is just a few hundred dollars worth of soil cells, but it can link the tree roots to an abundance of green space, which means we're going to get these big, nice, healthy trees planted into our boulevards instead of these little skinny ones where the root systems have just got no room to go. So again, reach out to, to me or Bill if you've got any questions at all on, on how you can do that because they're very, very inexpensive. Now let's look at some projects. This one is probably our best project we've done to this date. This one's in Rossland. This is in British Columbia. And this system, oh sorry, this streetscape was was beautiful. It, the the architecture, as you can see, is a little different, and it's extremely touristy. There's you know literally hundreds of thousands of tourists come through this small town every year, and they had a bunch of large trees that really made it look fantastic. And unfortunately, these trees were past their past their lifetime, and they had to come out. And this city was really worried about, hey, what do we do? Or sorry, this town was really worried about getting these big trees back into this space. So they used our system. And this tree growth that you can see here is actually only six years this tree's been growing. And they're all the same, all the way down the street. I think we planted about 35 trees into this streetscape and all of them are doing very, very well. Very, very impressed. And and the town you know, can't say enough good things about, about the system and what it did for them. Uh, Winnipeg, we do tons and tons of work in Winnipeg. This uh, One Earth was where our cells went. And the reason the cells were in here was because we've got very heavy traffic running up and down the street. So we really want to have a strong product in here. Uh, doing really, really well. No, no disasters in the sidewalk whatsoever, or this One Earth area. Disney, we do a ton, tons and tons of work with Disney. Um, at every park, pretty much. And uh, Disney like us because they never have to go in again and do any repairs to any sidewalks or any roads or anywhere for that matter, which of course is, is vital to them. And they get these big trees that are really good for shade for the people lining up for the rides. So if you've been to Disney like I have, they can be uh, can be fairly timely. Vegas, uh, there was no, no city, I don't think, in, in the US that needs our product more than Vegas. They need shade for people walking around and they also want to capture every single drop of water that lands onto their surfaces. Stradivault is a really, really great, great way of doing that. So uh, again, if you live in a hot climate, come talk to us, we can, we can help you. And that is the end of my presentation, guys. It's a pleasure chatting with you. I'll take, but Bill will take any questions you've got now. Well, I will. And I'll tell you what, Steve, I have a couple for us just to keep rolling here. Um, one, and thank you. Good job, as always. I love I love hearing your voice instead of my voice. But um, when you talked about the Kinsman parking lot, the question I have was, when you say not all soil cells, or not all of the Stradivault cells are filled with soil, um, but some of them are left open in between. Say we have trees that are far apart, but we want to have a continuous bed of Stradivault units. What do you do between the soil filled units and the empty units? Do they do you stop the connections and run a, a separator fabric or something between those? Yeah, it's a couple of things you can do. You can definitely do that with uh, we use uh, 
a biaxial geogrid. So we, we could put that in and prevent that soil from getting out of that space. Or what we can do is we can use different types of soil media too. So we could have a really nice tree that works really well for uh, for tree growth around the trees. And then we can sort of go more into a biofiltration media, which helps the water drain through it a lot quicker. And then we go back into the tree mix again. Or we can just simply drop that soil volume down in certain areas, keep the same soil type, but drop it down to allow more void space above the soil. So that's what we did on this project. But there's many, many different things you can do because it, it, it can be a bit of a mix between, OK, we need big trees, but we also need great filtration and, and we need to get this water down fast in, in some cases as well. So we're, we're experts in that field and we can help you with design what type of soil you want in there. Good. I, I was just curious if you had the open cells um, and you put more soil on one side than the other, does it, are you worried about that soil migrating through the system and leveling out to where you don't have, it's all the same once it becomes saturated? Um, I, that's why I didn't know if you had to hold, put something in there to hold the soil volume back from the empty cells uh, with the, with that like combi grid, for example, the combination of the non-woven geotextile and the geo grid, which I think you mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if if one section's empty, you definitely want to be putting some sort of barrier in there, and of course that barrier is going to be permeable as well. So, yeah. great question. Yeah, good one. And then when you talked about um, that, the price for installation might vary based on a contractor's experience. You're right. We know about that. So one of the things we've been doing over the last several years with our engineered products like Stratavault is we all we've always we've always included pre-construction meetings in what we offer. That's as a distributor over a large area, that's what we're really good at. We're experts at being on site for pre-construction meetings to make sure everyone knows who's doing what and how to do it. But what we found benefit to was even before that, we go to pre-bid meetings. If a contractor sees something on the plans that they're not familiar with, but they know us, we'll go meet with that contractor and educate them and even bring the samples and show them a demonstration of how to assemble the units at their shop before they even bid it. So they can get, like you say, a realistic expectation of the man hours, people hours that go into it and what their production rate might be. And I'll go one better. Uh, for anybody that's watching this, we offer pre-design meetings and that could be with Steve Lovering joining me and I'll try to be there in person. If I can't, we'll be there virtually and we'll answer all of these questions at the landscape architect's office or the engineer's office and, or with their team with the city, county or state. We can do the pre-design meeting pre-bid meeting and pre-construction meeting and add value through that whole spectrum. Absolutely. Yeah, our, our design team is is a bit special and um, landscape architects engineers have really enjoyed using it in the past. Good. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I have to echo and I haven't done a great job of this until recently is it's all about having this right specifications. If you just say uh, soil cell or you just say buy something that can hold the soil in one area and hold stormwater in the other area, you're not going to get the value that City Green or ASP, Quick Supply, Bowman Construction Supply, or Cascade Geosynthetics offers. You need to specify the product that you're, uh, that you're confident in, that you trust. And if you're worried about a sole source, don't be. Put that on the plan, and then if we have to work through that, we are a master distributor for a lot of solutions. We can help with that. But I think it's really important that the engineer and landscape architect write specifications that are going to help protect their design and the integrity of their design. Look forward to uh, working with you in the future. If you've got any of these type of type of products, it's really fantastic what we're doing with green infrastructure. Ed. I love it. And uh, please reach out and let, let's get some uh, some problems solved here. Well, how about that? Transforming gray to green, just like we talked about. Now you know the truth. That is a recorded interview with Steve Lovering because he's actually in England right now as we're doing this webinar live. And I knew he would not be available today, but I wanted him to be a part of this. And our next speaker, Mr. Tom Bowman from Rocky Mountain Bioproducts, who is my coworker and my friend because Rocky Mountain Bioproducts is part of Bowman Construction Supply. Tom is in a meeting in Colorado. So I did something similar with Tom and I recorded his interview as well. And I'll transition to that next. But um, together we're all transforming gray to green as Steve says, and we're working on sustainable solutions. 
Tom is a huge part of that because he talks about Biosol and other products that promote soil health so that we can actually get vegetation. And he can do it in Colorado where he lives and he can do it anywhere. So with that, Mr. Tom Bowman. So now we're joined uh, by Tom Bowman with Rocky Mountain Bioproducts, one of our Hale Holdings family of businesses. And Tom is our vegetated solutions expert. And Tom, we just heard from Steve Lovering of City Green talking about the Stratovault soil cells for urban trees. And when we say soil, I think of you and soil health. So with that, I'd like to hear what you have to say about um, better soil health and what kind of suggestions you have for us going forward. Yeah, thank you, Bill. And Steve gives a great uh, discussion on, on their product and creating just sustainable trees in these urban environments. And I love the concept. And it's always been a, an issue whenever anyone's walked around a city and seen these trees and these uh, streetscapes, if you will, side sidewalkscapes, if you will. Um, and a, soil is a, a big key to that. So I appreciate the opportunity. And in talking about vegetation management and tree health and soil health, one of the things we like to talk about and share with people is that there's uh, numerous different types of soils around the world. There are over 12 dominant soil classifications in the world. In the United States, with over 70,000 different types of soil in the United States. So, therefore, we don't always know what we're getting. And in many cases, we can put things and, and manufacture soils, we can develop a soil. But how do we get those soils to be consistent or to consistently have nutrients that are going to supply the tree or that, that urban streetscape, whether it's maybe it's native plants, maybe it's some shrubs, maybe it's some native grasses? All the above, yeah. Yeah, so so really, our key component with that is we have a product that's called Biosol Forte. This is a unique product. It's over 95% beneficial fungal and bacterial biomass. Um, it's over 70% organic matter. That's key, and we'll talk about organic matter and how that impacts the health of soil and what that does for, for plant life. The beauty of this product is only one half of 1% of it is even soluble. So with that said, if, if we're working in an area such as Seattle, Portland, where they get lots of rains, or whether we're, we're working in a streetscape such as Denver, Colorado, or maybe, maybe it's Kansas City or St. Louis, areas that just don't get the amount of rain as, as Seattle does. The other nice part of this product is it's neutral it's very neutral in the ph and because of the compounds of it and we'll talk about that here in a second we see nutrients lasting for three to five years so what is this unique product again it's this is biosol forte is a fermented plant-based product it is beneficial bacteria and fungal biomass it is all fermented plant material there is no animal byproducts in this it is we could we could classify this as a food grade quality product as is it was originally fish food and cattle feed. It is the byproduct of the penicillin fermentation process and other antibiotic fermentation processes. That's where that we, we're getting the fungal bacterial biomass from the penicillin production and the bacterial biomass from others. Um, that fermentation process absolutely binds these nutrients to be slower or longer lasting, more stable, and longer lasting. So really, we look at this as a multi-nutrient soil amendment, promoting soil health and for plant life. So we take these raw ingredients, and this would be no different than taking our barley and hops. Well, that's one thing, but when we ferment it, it turns into that bright, that pitcher of beer. So if you're watching <laughs> this at that later hour, I hope I'm not making you thirsty. Stay with us for a little bit longer while you get through the presentation. But all these numbers aren't always the same. When we look at nutrients in fertilizers or soil amendments, it, just because it's, something says it's a 7 to one a 10 10 10 doesn't always mean it's the same. So we need to look at where those nutrients come from. So the Biosol Forte is, again, it's over 70% organic matter. That organic matter um, does not need any further maturing or curing or stabilizing it is a stable nutrient due to that fermentation process. Th this organic matter supports plant life and soil life. It minimizes soil compaction, i.e. that's a 
that can be a critical issue when we talk about urban streetscapes. It's also going to increase the water holding capacity of soils. And we've been proven to, to build soil humus seven times faster than natural succession does. Now, again, I we talked about the bacterial and fungal biomass. Very key and very unique to this pro to the product because your bacterial biomass enhances soil structure. It's going to feed soil microbes. It's going to keep soil nutrients in the root zone. One of the big things it does is it filters and breaks down pollutants in the soils. So as these streetscapes, as, and we all know, we've all seen them. You walk around, you see all the dirt and all the pollutants that have been washed into these tree wells. This is an area that's going to help that. And that we know that soil um, cleans pollutants out very effectively. That our fungal biomass in the product converts those hard to digest organic matters into food for the plants. That's important for nutrient cycling and water dynamics. Another one of the key components of the whole product is our mycelium. That's really the base of this product. Mycelium is the vegetative part of fungus that supports the development of mycorrhiza. So, when, and we will talk about mycorrhiza here shortly, but mycorrhiza is key for expanding root zones. But it's a natural biomass that's naturally occurring in healthy soils. So when we've these soil cells are, are filled with outside soil media, whether it's for the tree, whether it's for uh, uh, bioretention, but they are developed. Now the most important part of the fungus is the mycelium. So that enhances that relationship with the mycorrhiza. So we're increasing the plant's ability to utilize more soil nutrients in the surrounding areas. The other key component that's in the product is, is our chitin. It, that's the exoskeleton of, of fungi, like shellfish. Think of crabs, think of uh, when you eat, peel, and eat shrimp. You know, we all love to eat, peel, and eat shrimp. What do you do with that shellfish or the shell when you pe peel the shrimp? Throw it away. That is the, ex that's chitin. It's a nit nitrogenous natural polysaccharide. It's a stable, organically bound source of nitrogen. It's unique. It's again, this doesn't come from plant material or animal waste. It is actually the, is there's no manures in this. It is insoluble in water. It's resistant to decay. And the beauty of it is it retains a lot of water. So, and lastly, one of the great things, especially in these treescapes and these areas where soils are, have been highly disturbed, it's gonna help disease suppression. And then we, we're high in carbon, and that carbon is the basis for soil fertility. Um, so as you see here on the, on, the, on the screen, it looks like a honeycomb, much like what the, uh, the chitin content does. I'm gonna back up to, to that for one second. You can see the, the, the lower picture there. It looks like a honeycomb, very similar to the carbon. That's actually a great housing unit, an apartment building, neighborhood, whatever we want to call it for the microbes. So it protects them, also helps them um, buffer against harmful substances in the soils. So when we talk about releasing nutrients, and I show this for a couple reasons. Many of our job sites we have people that are adding compost. We have people that are wanting to, to fertilize a tree for a short period, or fertilize a tree thinking that, hey, we can throw nutrients in there and it's gonna last. Well, this was a study that was done by Caltrans and, and uh, or UC Davis for Caltrans, the Federal Highway Administration. And if we look at this, we are going to see these flat lines here. And this is compost. Now, these guys tested compost, ammonium phosphate. Here's another type of compost, poultry manure, coated slow release um, uh, nutrients, and then the biosol. And that is a, a wide variety of, of products. Are there, it's almost encompasses any product you could include in this. So is what they found is that your composts don't ever give nutrients back. And in this case, it's pretty flat lined. Many times that's due to the curing and maturing of compost. And we'll show that here in a second. But what we see here is we see the composted mix, which was a urea with a compost, coming straight off the screen. So by the third time they try to flush nutrients, 
they had almost flushed all the nutrients out. We also see ammonium phosphate here, which was releasing just like the like the uh, compost it makes, the urea. Those two urea products were releasing well before they were ever able to really get into that soil profile. So they they may volatilize into the atmosphere or into the water. To, to get to the point here, we see the biosol lasting much longer than anything else, any of the other products on the market. So we know that because of that fermentation process, what happens is we've got a long-term release. Now, as I touched on when we show compost, this is a study that's done by UC Davis as well, simply showing, and the baseline here is the high altitude granitic topsoil. We're not gonna put that into a tree well, they're gonna try to create a topsoil. However, we still see nutrients sucking, or compost sucking out nutrients for up to 300 to 350 days before they start giving those nutrients back. So stability of the product, let's talk about that because this, there's some key components that we see here. These are lab analyses that were done by a lab in, in a, outside of Nebraska or outside of Lincoln, Nebraska. And it's what we notice here is that we have nutrient values of a 721, which is our biosol forte. It actually holds on to this nutrients. Now, mind you, these are minimum numbers. When when we get a fertilizer and they say it's a 721, a 641, a 611, that is a minimum number. However, we see in many cases turkey waste or chicken waste where our numbers are half of what their their declared minimum is. The other important part of this is let's look at the organic carbon. Again, we talk about the carbon being key into soils and maximizing water and maximizing soil health and maximizing um, that carbon sequestration for plants. And we see that our biosol forte is much higher in carbon than, than uh, manure-driven products. So we show that really for the standpoint of stability and what is really in this product. This is a test plot that was done in Missouri with the Missouri Department of Transportation between biosol and a poultry byproduct. So again, we're taking that fine aged uh, nutrients after we fermented it. So in summary, let's before we get into some case studies, this biosol forte is gonna provide long-term nutrients for over 360 days. And that's due to that chitin content I mentioned, that, that shell of shellfish, the crab, the, the um, shrimp. It's got the ability to improve soil structure. Um, that's building a humus factor. We're going to stimulate and feed microbial life. That's the mycorrhiza. That's due to that fungal and bacterial biomass where we're going to retain a lot of moisture. Again, it's from that chitin. It's long-lasting and stable due to the fermentation process. What we do notice, or I should say what we don't notice, is the quick green up. So and that's really more in turf that we don't see a quick green up, but trees, you never see anything that's gonna give you a quick bloom anyways. You're just looking for for continued uh, health of that tree and bigger leaves, healthier leaves. You know, so yet yeah, we've all driven around the, around natural uh, national parks down the end of the mountains. And we've seen trees like this growing. You wonder why? Well. This is that mycorrhiza discussion that I told you we'd talk about briefly. Mycorrhiza stands for root fungus. That's what mycorrhiza stands for. It's the below ground connection. So as we see here, and you can, we see the kind of the orangey tap roots, the main roots of this plant. And then you see all the light, white, gray areas around it. That is our mycorrhizal hyphae. That is, the equivalent to the hairs on your arms and legs that are able to dive into smaller soil particles. As a reference, if I said to you, try to dive, stick your fingers into your keyboard and stick it down in between that gap between the, the keys and, and, the, and the surface. You can't do it with a finger, but if I give you a hair or a very, very thin wire, you can reach down there. And our mycorrhizae is doing the exact same thing. So what's it look like up close? Well, here it is. And as we see the mycorrhizal hyphae growing off this taproot, but we see some of these 
as they're starting to develop, we see this garden hose effect. And that garden hose is where those nutrients and water transferred back and forth. So again, make, making our plants much more, much healthier. So we love to see when we use mycorrhiza, and we love to see multiple species mycorrhiza, because some are better at use at uh, at nutrient retrieval. Some are much better at at water retrieval. Some are better with disease suppression and environmental stress. So we talk about we're filling these soil soil cells, as Steve brought up, with a manufactured soil or with a compost or with a top with a what they would call that topsoil, right? So if we disturb the top three to nine inches, we're destroying that mycorrhizal life that's in natural healthy soils. So how do we create that? How do we get that back? And we do that by adding a mycorrhizal product into it because as this study shows you right here, disturbing the top nine inches, and I know that those soil cells are gonna be at least 12 inches, if not deeper, we're talking, we've destroyed 97% of the mycorrhizal life in soils. So how are we helping city green and how are we helping these trees become better and healthier soils? This is how. So let's fly over some projects, look at, look at some projects that have been done and see what, how, how these things have happened. So this is the native landscaping. This is outside of Boulder, Colorado. And you can see some small pine trees here. As you can see some trees here and up in the hill. Again, this is not vegeted or not watered whatsoever, not, no irrigation. Here's a creek alignment project. And I show this for this reason. Steve did a great job in talking about how soils buffer out pollutants. And in this project, here we are used right along the water side, right along the creek. So this product, again, as I said, was fish food and cattle feed at one point. It is completely safe to be used in waterways. I'm going to show you a, a reclamation project here. And again, I'm showing this for the sake. Look at the water in this. This is a super fun site in Montana. And the water quality became a big issue here. As you can see, the orange water there on your left hand side, cleaner water on the right. That really tells a story. That's beautiful. Yeah, this is a and and we see we've seen this happen in numerous areas with mines. And again, I show this photo. This is this is strictly decomposed granitic soils. If you look at the bottom here, this is a tailings cap of a mine site. The reason I show this again, look how long it's been. One application 10 years later. Now, mind you, this isn't irrigated. This gets snowfall, rainfall, and that's it. And then we have a pipeline project. Again, simply showing you the longevity of it. So let's get into what, what our discussion is really about is these urban scapes, these, whether it's native plants, whether it's trees and shrubs, native grasses. So this is a combined product of our, of the biosol, a humate and a mycorrhiza, along with a tree. Now here's, this is obviously a different setting than the tree. However, let me tell you the quick story of this. And I don't know why that jumped ahead, but we're gonna hold it right there is our distributor put on a cup and a half of biosol forte onto that tree before or after that it had been planted. So we see better tree health, better trees. Here's Clyde Warren Park in Dallas, Texas. And you can see the native areas. We were not used in the in the grasses, but we were used in the native, uh, native grass areas of the site. And again, there's a great site of the native plants growing along the sidewalk. And then we get into zero scaping. Again, limited water, but great tree plant, tree growth. And then we look at tree and native plants as again, turf grass and your natives. So we've been used in a lot of different settings and a lot of different areas to show how it works. Here's a site that this was a river that was had been buried by the dam for over close to a hundred years. And this dam, is, is what they did That's after removing the dam and letting all the water from the dam flush out, they were coming in to restore the riverbed and the creek a hundred years afterwards. So this was in a totally anaerobic situation. 
So our soil cells would never have that situation. But I show it for that purpose. And then let's talk about, again, the longevity and the, and, and the, uh, the healthiness of the product. Again, this was a product that was used right here at Steigerwald National Wildlife Refuge, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So it's got to be clean water. It's, it's got to be um, no pollutants can go into these water systems. And that's what we're showing with that one. There's another photo of it with that same project. And you can see it's ongoing construction there with the levee. And then again, here's another wildlife refuge. And again, you can see there that's an eight years after the fact. That's one application. And again, there's uh, they've had no algae blooms, no, no issues with the water for this. So with that, Bill and Steve, I appreciate you guys asking me to be part of this. So we look at the art of building soil or building dirt in the productive soils. So your dirty problem with our biosolution, we can help in creating sustainable tree life uh, in streetscapes, in cityscapes, and maybe it's, um, and I love what, what Stradivault's doing in City Green. I think that they're expanding that root zone and giving these trees a chance to flourish. The key with that is now is keeping those trees healthy with good long-term stable nutrients. For That's questions. perfect timing. Uh, thank you to everybody that um, participated for the webinar, tried to ask questions here. I ask that you please reach out to us and schedule a lunch and learn uh, with your company or breakfast and learn or even a sit down one on one with any of us. So Steve Lovering will be happy to join me for those. So will Tom Bowman and they can join us virtually unless we can just coordinate to be in your city uh, at the same time. That'd be great, too. Again, I'm Bill Murphy. Thank you for joining us today. Sorry for a little bit of technical difficulty. I hope that you got something out of this presentation today. We will record it and put it on our YouTube channel. And a reminder, we will put the recording of the February interrupted webinar. I'm completing that video. We'll upload that to the YouTube channel as well. That'll be the first part for water quality. And this is uh, part two for stormwater quality. Again, thanks for joining us. I appreciate you and I hope you all take care.